There is now a hope that lasts beyond our days For the one that once was buried lives again Now the tomb is buried Hearted, all you want and we come find living water, everlasting streams to the wandering spirit, lost in searching, wanting something more. Find the risen King who overcomes the world. Oh, let there be dancing in the darkness and let our song break through the night lift your voice and sing that Christ is King for Jesus is alive no more condemnation no more doubt and fear for our sin and shame have no power here in his resurrection perfect love has set the captives free praise the risen king who stands in victory oh let there be dancing in the darkness and let our song break through the night your voice and sing that Christ is King for Jesus is alive. Let there be dancing in the darkness and let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King for Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Death is undone, hallelujah. Jesus is one, hallelujah. We overcome, oh, in Jesus, oh, in Jesus. Hallelujah. Death is undone, hallelujah. Jesus has won, hallelujah. We overcome, oh, in Jesus, oh, in Jesus. Hallelujah. Death is undone, hallelujah. Jesus is one, hallelujah. We overcome, oh, in Jesus, oh, in Jesus. Oh, let there be dancing in the darkness, and let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King for Jesus is alive. Let it be dancing in the darkness and let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King, Lord Jesus is alive. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King, for Jesus is alive. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb And in desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. Could imagine 
In case you haven't heard it yet, we are so glad that you've chosen to worship here with us at Bedford Community Church. We are a community of believers who want to know God, be known by God and others, and to make God known. We're glad that you're here to be a part of that. We have some quick announcements for you in order to help you connect with what's going on here at Bedford Community Church. First, camp this past week was great. Thanks to all of you who helped in some fashion. Our kids had a great day, we got to know them better, and they got to know God much better. Speaking of being known better, 
Over the last few weeks, we've been trying to stop and get pictures of as many people as possible, but we need your help. We know many more people need a photo or an updated photo in our directory. If you haven't had your picture taken in the last couple of weeks, would you send me one? You can send a picture, mostly just a headshot, to me at sarah at bedfordcommunitychurch.org. This will help us get to know each other better, especially as our community continues to grow. You know what else grows? Pumpkins. Okay, admittedly, that's a sad transition, but I wanted to remind you that coming up October 20th is Pumpkin Palooza. It's a great opportunity for you to join us after the second service or to come back after the second service for a time of fellowship, of getting to know one each other, of being known by each other. You can meet new people, you can paint some pumpkins. It's also a great opportunity to, for you to invite someone to join us here at church. We hope that you will take the time and join us on October 20th for Pumpkin Palooza. And we wanna thank those of you who consider BCC your home and give here. It's your generosity that allows us to do what we do. If you're wondering how you can give here at Bedford Community Church, there are four ways. You can do it in person at the back of the sanctuary as a box where you can put your tithes and offerings. You can mail a check to the church, or you can visit our website or give on the app if you prefer to give electronically. Thanks again for being here, and we're glad that you're here. Good morning, Bedford Community Church. I'm so glad that you're here today with us. My name is Pastor Dan. Uh, I just want to open with a word of prayer, and then we'll continue looking at our scripture in the book of Acts. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that as we open your word today, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear the truth of how you are at work in the world. Lord, I pray that you would help us to find our place in this story. I pray that you would show us how this truth of Scripture applies uh, in our world today. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified in the hearing of your word and in the exposition of the text. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we began a new series on the book of Acts called The Sound and the Fury. I want to open up today by reading the, the beginning of the text that we're going to look at, which is found in Acts chapter 2. So you can turn with me in your Bibles or you'll see it up on the screen. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, says... When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And it divided tongues as of fire, a divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each one of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and even visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we were all, uh, we hear them telling us in our own language the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked, saying they are filled with new wine." The word of the Lord. Well, if you remember last week when we began our study of the book of Acts, we, we spoke about how this book was written by the physician Luke. And he writes in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, as well as at the beginning of the book of Acts, that this book written to a man named Theophilus was meant to provide certainty, assurance, that the things of God that had happened in Jesus and were happening through the early church were authentic and real and true. And he, he makes evidence through this by uh, encouraging the hearers of this book when it was written to go and speak with the eyewitnesses, to test and see the proofs that were given about all that God had done and was doing. And here again now, at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, we have a miraculous event similar to the ascension of Jesus, which maybe earlier readers or, or skeptics would have said, there's no way that happened. In Acts chapter 2, we have a miraculous event where people are speaking in a new tongue. 
Tongues that they had not known before, covering the entire known world. And surely audiences back in the, in the first century, as well as audiences hearing this story today, wrote and thought, oh, I'm not quite sure I'm buying this one, Luke. But he writes again, so that we may have certainty. Uh, this week when I was doing some study, I had the opportunity to look up some of the archaeological history of uh, what was transpiring at the end of the Gospel of Luke and the beginning of the, na the narrative of Acts around kind of the story of the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one of the interesting things that I came across is something that's called the Nazareth Decree. And this was written uh, in the early times of the Roman Empire. There's some that place it during the time of Caesar Augustus, which would have been during the time that Jesus had died and rose and uh, risen. Some put it a little bit after this at the time of Emperor Claudius, maybe around 43 AD, which would have been the time that Luke was writing, the book of Acts. And the Nazareth Decree, which you can find still if you go to the Louvre in France, the actual document that I'm talking about is there and you can go and read it. And this document was stated and signed by the Roman Empire, and it was sent out, and it says very clearly that anyone who is found to have moved a dead body or fabricated stories about dead people coming back to life and moving, anyone who, who acts in this, they call it wicked intent, is guilty to the point of receiving death as the penalty. It says that, I'll read it, I wish that any violator would suffer capital punishment under the title of a tomb breaker and deceiver. And so when, when, when Luke writes in the book of Acts, O Theophilus, I want you to know with certainty the things that I'm talking about, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the empowerment of the church were true. This was potentially for Luke and for the other disciples if they had been found to be lying, if they had been found to be false. This was a capital offense. And yet they were so certain in such belief of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again and sent his spirit, that they were willing not just to go out and proclaim it, but to write it down, to put their names behind it and say, this is true. Prove me wrong. And 2,000 years later, the evidence time and time again points to the fact that this was and is true today. And so as we look at the story of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, I, I urge you, consider putting your skepticism aside and wondering what could this word mean for me today if it were true as the early disciples really believed that it was. Well, we find ourselves in this story, the Pentecost story, in the broader theme that we're looking at called the sound and the fury. And if you remember from last week, if you were with us last week, we talked about the sound and the fury is really meant to symbolize this idea that a lot of our striving and all of our efforts, the things we put our life to, ultimately tend to end up in nothing but just noise and chaos. And it comes from a quote from Macbeth. Last week we had David MacDonald read for us uh, the soliloquy from Macbeth, Acts 5, Scene 5, and it was such a hit, actually, it, it's back by popular request. So I'm going to give that to you now as context, but the one, the one criticism that we got was nobody really understands a Scottish accent, and that's very much true. So this time, David MacDonald is back for you all, but with subtitles, so that you can glean from us uh, the, the beauty of Shakespeare's poetry in Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays of lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, and hopefully this week you were able to catch the final line. Life is like a story told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. It is in this world to which the author, Luke, 
wrote the book of Acts, a world of chaos and confusion where the Israelite people were oppressed, where they were under the hand of the Romans, where their Messiah had been killed and rose again, where people are persecuting the early church, where there is sound and fury all around them, he writes about the account of what God is doing. And in the same way, we who find ourselves in a world of division and confusion and contention, a sound of striving and efforts, a world defined by sound and fury, we have a word today from God. And what I want to talk to you about today from Acts chapter 2, the story of what God is beginning to do amongst his people, is a story about dreams, dreams and visions. Maybe you, like me, uh, had some dreams and visions when you were a kid. Uh, I remember, like, right when you're in kindergarten, you go to school the first day, and one of the projects that I had to do is, like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And when you're in kindergarten, you have grandiose visions of what you want to do when you grow up. Actually, mine wasn't even that grandiose. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, mafia capital of the world, and so what I wanted to do when I grow up, I want to be a garbage man. I get to tour around, drive on that big truck early in the morning, annoy my neighbors by waking them up, maybe pick through the trash, find a thing or two. And uh, there were some kids in my school that were, their families were in the garbage business, if you know what I mean, and they seemed to be doing all right. And so for me as a kindergartner, my dream actually wasn't that high. I want to be a garbage man. But so many kids, right, they had to, I want to be a professional athlete. I want to be an astronaut. And when you're in kindergarten, you can dream big. But it's interesting, you ask those same kids when they get to high school, what do you want to be? And the kid that wanted to be an astronaut when he was in kindergarten and got raucous applause from the teacher and approval and praise, by the time they're sitting with their guidance counselor in high school, I want to be an astronaut. The guidance counselor is looking at them, looking at their SAT score. I don't know, kid. I don't even know if you're going to make it to community college, let alone make it to NASA. And that dream gets squashed just a little bit. Maybe they make it to the good school and they go to college and they're studying and they still this, but then by the time they're hitting senior year, what do you want to do? I want to be an astronaut. And the head of their science department says, oh, you're good. You know the physics, you know the math, but you know like they only send like one in a million people up to space. This is the, the idea that you could actually be an international astronaut, so astronomically small. Maybe you could work for NASA, but be an astronaut, uh, maybe temper those dreams a little bit. Uh, and then by the time you're middle-aged, man, have you ever walked up to a middle-aged man and say, oh, what do you want to do? Uh, I'd love to be an astronaut. Meanwhile, they're over working at, maybe they're working as a garbage man, I don't know, or working down the, and, and it's just the idea that that dream should be dead. That dream, it's not going to happen, if it hasn't happened by the time you hit middle age, you're not going to be an astronaut unless you happen to have billions of dollars like Richard Branson or something like that. It, it's, it's a slow death of dreams from kindergarten to high school to College to adult life is oftentimes for so many of us a slow death of dreams. Um, and it's not just vocational dreams either. Uh, I think oftentimes really the reality of the sound and fury of life is that it is the death of so many of our dreams. I just want to meet the right spouse and have a healthy relationship. I want to have a good marriage. I want my kids to do better than they are. I, I had such great dreams and visions for what they would achieve, for all, all the ways they would fulfill the things that I couldn't fulfill. I really thought my kid was going to be a garbage man when I didn't get to be, right? I'm living vicariously through them. But slowly, it seems like even those dreams start to die. And I think for so many of us, uh, our family life and our corporate life and our social life over time becomes a graveyard of buried dreams. But God has something to say about that. He shows up on the scene here in Acts 2 after Jesus had ascended into heaven and the disciples were left kind of looking at each other. Well, I guess Jesus told us to wait, so we'll wait around for a little bit. We'll get busy. We'll, we'll put in a new disciple for Judas who left. We'll do some, uh, some busy work, some business work, if you will get the details in place. We'll spend some time in prayer. Uh, but really, we don't know exactly what we're going to be doing now. The dreams of Israel being restored were dead. The dreams of Jesus being this victorious militant leader, this new king, seemed pretty dead. 
the dreams of the disciples who was going to sit on his right side and his left side as Caesar was overthrown dead. The dreams that the, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were going to lose their political and religious authority amongst the Israelites seemed dead. Dead dreams, dead dreams, dead dreams. And yet in spite of that, it is here that the Holy Spirit comes in a new way, in a powerful way. And it says that he is poured out on the believers. He comes in like a rushing wind. He rests upon them like tongues of fire. And we see in a unique way, God brings his own sound and fury into the dead dreams of the believers. And when they go out, they speak in a new and in a powerful way. And the crowd, they kind of respond to Peter uh, and to the disciples with two questions. The first of which they say, what does this mean? Uh, and the other half of the group, they say, maybe they're filled with new wine. Maybe they've been hitting the bottle a little bit early. Uh, and Peter, he responds to these kind of in reverse order. He says to the first group, it's not that we're drunk, it's only 9 a.m., which to me is a pretty hilarious rebuttal on behalf of the leading of the apostles that his reason for them not being drunk was, no, it's, it's a little early for that, guys. Uh, but then he responds to them who are asking, what does this mean? What does this mean? that God poured out his spirit, that these people are doing a miraculous event. We thought that they were gone. We saw them all run off and hide a few weeks ago. We saw the Messiah die. We saw this come to an end. And now what does this mean? That they're back and they're back with such power, with such movement, with such gusto, with such ability to speak to all the languages of the earth. And Peter, he steps up and he answers that question. What does it mean? And you find it here, if we continue on, in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse seven, or 16. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will see visions. Your young men will dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, smoke and vapor. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Read that last verse again. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, when the Spirit of God pours out on the disciples, something amazing happens. And the first amazing thing that happens is that it is a pouring out for everybody. I think sometimes we miss this. This is unprecedented, even amongst the Jewish people. They had seen the Spirit of God pour out on people before, but it was always specific people for specific times and specific purposes. And I'll tell you, it was mostly on men of importance. Kings, maybe, were anointed with the Spirit. Prophets, leaders that spoke for God, would receive the Spirit. But Paul, uh, Peter is saying the prophecy of Joel has come true, that the Spirit of God is poured out on all people. And he goes above and beyond by saying it's across gender. Men and women will receive this pouring out of the Spirit. Young and old receive this ability. Slave and free Age, gender, class, all of them diminished under the power and the new working of God through his Holy Spirit as it is poured off. And the result of the pouring out of this Spirit is prophecy and dreams and vision. What is prophecy? Well, spoken easily, prophecy is speaking truth, uh, specifically speaking truth of what is to come. Uh, oftentimes when we see in the Old Testament the prophets, sometimes they had longer forethought uh, from a word from God of what was going to happen. But oftentimes prophecy was a direct word to a king or to a leader about what God was about to do or what he was already doing in spite of the common opinion of the people. Prophecy is speaking truth on behalf of God. And the prophecy that is spoken is the prophecy that comes through the dreams and the visions. See, in order to speak truth about what is to come, what God is doing, the new things that are happening, you have to have the dream or the vision of what God is going to do to be able to speak it. And now, with the coming and the pouring of the Holy Spirit, 
men and women, young and old, rich and poor, all of them can receive dreams and visions of what God is going to do. When I was in Lebanon, there was uh, a student of ours that came from another country to study, and I, I won't mention where he's from or his name for security reasons, but he was of Muslim background. And he shared with us how he came to Christ through a dream. He was in his dream studying the Quran in his room as he would do on a normal uh, kind of daily basis. But in his dream, Jesus came and, and showed up in the room. He said it was like a bright figure showed up and told him to put away that book that he didn't need to study it because he, the bright figure, was the true word. He was the word from God. And this student didn't know what to do in the dream, didn't know what to do. And, and Jesus came to him and he says, he says that Jesus came and embraced him. And he said, I love you. That is the word for today. And when he woke up, he found himself having just been weeping in his dreams because the word made flesh appeared and told him that he was loved. That changed that student's life. He set out on a trajectory to figure out who was this bright figure that showed up in his dream. He ended up connecting with a, a, a Christian worker in the era who told him about the gospel of Jesus Christ and who told him the words that Jesus says that he is the word from the beginning of John. And this student began to shift the way he understood his orientation in life, his religious faith, and he came to a relationship with Christ. And now he has graduated from our school and gone back and started new ministries in this country for the sake of the gospel because he had a dream. Dream. a real dream in this case, a dream where the Lord showed up to him. But dreams sometimes are broader than this literal sleeping type of dreams. Dreams and visions can be the aspirations that God gives our spirit to see the way in which he is working. And these to me so often are the dreams that God tries to grow in us and the world tries so desperately to kill. See, the reality is that if God is the dream giver, if he is the one who pours out his spirit so that we may have dreams and visions, then the enemy of our souls and the world around us are the dream killers. They try and snatch up this picture. They try and have us question our identity. They have us try and question our ability. They try and have us question the authenticity of the dream that God has given us. And the sound and the fury of life, the monotony of daily rhythms, our desires for the world, they pull us away from the dreams that God has given us. But Peter is here to tell us, and the gospel story here is to tell us that when the Holy Spirit comes, you will dream dreams. You will have visions of the great things that God can do in your life. And I think about Bedford Community Church and what it would be like if we were a church that was willing to dream dreams again. To believe that God wanted to do the miraculous in and through us. That those desires that God has put into our hearts, that those abilities that he has granted us to serve him, that those powers he has blessed us with in the gifting of his spirit were not just something that was going to get squashed by the world or was meant to be contained and kept in the church. But what if we dreamed big dreams about what God wanted to do in our community, in our world? We continue to read through Acts chapter 2. And we see one of the ways in which this dream manifests right away. Uh, Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 44, it says, All who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds, all that they had, to any in need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking breads in their home, they received food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day by day, those who were being saved. What if we dreamed about being a community that lived out the faith, hope, and love of Jesus Christ in a way so compelling that it is filling our hearts with gladness and generous spontaneity? What if we were willing to dream what it would be like to share all that we had between each other and to those in need? I think the result would still be the same today. The Lord would add to our numbers day by day by day. 
See, the early church was willing to receive the prophecy of Joel in the pouring out of the Spirit and to empower all people to once again start dreaming. I don't know what the world has told you about the dreams that you have. Maybe they've told you that your dreams were too big, and that they couldn't be accomplished, and so you've settled for something less. Maybe your dreams leaded, le led towards being self-focused. I have dreams for me and for my kingdom. And you pushed out instead the dreams of God for your life. Maybe your dreams just at some point seemed out of reach. I think it's really poignant that, uh, that Peter says in this passage, your old men shall dream dreams and your, your young shall receive visions. Uh, he incorporates both. Uh, there, there's sometimes where you say, oh man, you have, that's such a great dream, but you're too young for that. Like maybe later down the road. And Peter's saying, no, the young will receive these dreams and visions. And on the other side of the spectrum, maybe people have told you, you're, you're too old. Your days are past. They're behind you. But the Lord is saying, even those who are up in age will receive new dreams and new visions because God still wants to do something through them. It's interesting, this story... Um, the story of Pentecost kind of mirrors and is a little bit the fulfillment of an Old Testament story called the Tower of Babel. Uh, the Tower of Babel takes place in the book of Genesis, and it's a story about a people that had a dream. And their dream was to come together and to build a tower that reached up to heaven so that their glory could be great like God's. It was a, it was a prideful and a selfish dream, one apart from God's hope and blessing for them, which had been to be fruitful and multiply and cover the whole earth. Instead, they were unifying to gain strength for themselves. And so the result is that the people are scattered and their languages are uh, given diversity. And that's where we get the term Tower of Babel, the word like in English, to babble, to, to speak uncomprehensively, uh, because the people were scattered into different languages and could no longer understand one another. Their dream in some ways got broken because it was a dream apart from that of God. And the result was chaos and confusion. Uh, but here in Acts 2, when we have the pouring out of the Spirit of God, the reverse happens. Not quite the reverse, a transformation happens. The people are brought together under the Spirit of God, but they're not brought back into one unified dream and vision anymore, and they're not brought back into one language anymore. Instead, each person is able to receive the gifting and the dream and the vision of God for their life, for their purpose, to build up not their own kingdom, not a collective kingdom, but to build up the kingdom of God so that more people are coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus day by day by day. And so Bedford Community Church, I got to ask, what's your dream? What's your vision for your life, for your family, for this place? Because if we bring those together under the authority of Scripture, under the filling of the Spirit, we will have a community radically transforming our world for the sake of the gospel. Because God's dreams for your life are bigger than your dreams for your life. They're bigger than my dreams for your life. But if we fill them out, if we fulfill them in the power and the working of the Spirit, we will be an unstoppable movement. We will see, like they saw in Acts 2, the gospel go to all kinds of language groups and all kinds of people groups. Because whether you are young or old, male or female, free or slave, God has a dream to give you. And so I pray that you receive it. I pray that you treasure it. Because the sound and the fury of the world will try and squash it out. will tell you it's too grand, too ridiculous, too far-fetched, too unbelievable. But we see what happens when the early church follows it. More were added to their numbers every day because they took the dream, they took the vision, and they lived it out for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you give dreams and visions. I pray that even now, Lord, you would pour out your spirit on your people and that Bedford Community Church would be a place where people dream dreams and have visions. I pray that this church would be a, people, a place where people are free to prophesy, to speak the truth of what you are doing and what you will do. And I pray that you would give us the courage as a congregation, as a group of believers, to step forward 
and to live out the dreams that you give us so that we can see people added to our numbers coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ day by day by day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of That you rose, heart of heaven held its breath. So the stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood, and in his name, and in his freedom, I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who is resurrected me. Praise the Spirit.